Today, we're going to be unraveling the intricacies of uric acid. So we're going to be discussing where it comes from, why it matters, in particular with a focus on metabolism or insulin resistance and inflammation, and then ultimately what to do about it. Uric acid is generally simply considered a byproduct of the metabolism of a molecule called purines. Now, purines are, um, this is some kind of deep biochemistry here, but they're the purines as a family of molecules are sometimes referred to as a nitrogenous base. So they have some of the chemistry that gives them some a nitrogen, and they have what's called two rings, two chemical rings. You can imagine this complex structure. But when the body needs to metabolize purines, everything after all has a life cycle. It is, it is put together and then it is broken apart. Um, uric acid will be a consequence of that. And usually when uric acid is produced, it will be flowing through the blood in the plasma, and then it will simply be expelled in the urine. The kidneys very actively will bind or you know grab that uric acid and move it into what will become the urine. If the, either the production of the uric acid is too much or the excretion of the uric acid is insufficient, we'll start to have uric acid accumulate in the blood. And once it starts to get too high, we start to get a condition that is in this earlier phase called hyperuricemia. Now, just by way of teaching you guys some of the lingo here, and I am a professor after all, hyper, of course, means that the thing is elevated. And then whenever you hear that suffix, that ending of the word emia, it means in the blood. So hyperuricemia is just high uric acid levels um, in the blood. And when uric acid levels get too high, it can actually start to precipitate out. So normally, the uric acid is dissolved. And if you were looking at a tube of water with uric acid in it, you wouldn't see the uric acid. It's dissolved. It's mixed within the, the solvent of the water or the solution. However, when the levels start to get too high in the blood, the uric acid can start to come together and crystallize. And then they happen to crystallize often in joints. And so then the person can start to have gout. So gout is when the uric acid has reached a point that it is crystallizing or literally coming together as these jagged little crystals and then making people's joints ache. That is gout. But high uric acid levels can lead to higher uric acid in the in the urine, which can give rise to kidney stones that are based, that are sort of built on this same matrix of uric acid crystals. The first of the next questions would be us exploring why does uric acid matter? Why am I taking the time to talk about it? And why are you taking the time to listen? Not only this is becoming an increasingly common problem, and to my delight, uric acid is becoming an increasingly scrutinized clinical marker. It seems that we hear more about it in even direct clinical settings that uric acid is just now more and more considered just part of a normal checkup, uh, which is really good news. It matters. So why does it matter? I already elaborated it on it a little bit, namely that the uric acid will um, start to clump together, causing these uric acid crystal um, clumps, which start to literally poke and aggravate joints. Now, to lesser degree, of course, that's something that could be ha that could be happening every anywhere in the blood. The uric acid could be crystallizing and damaging blood vessels um, as well, uh, but that's not going to hurt like a joint is going to ache. You know, you can't feel something poking into your blood vessel. There's just no pain receptors to sense that. Now, in addition to simply the high levels of uric acid. There are additional variables that can cause the uric acid to start to crystallize and start clumping together. That can include temperature. So as temperature changes and starts to cool off, that can increase the crystallization. And that might be one of the reasons why our hands can get this because our hands are often colder than the core of the body. Blood pH can affect it. And then of course, as I mentioned, the concentration. One of the things, the thing that interested me most over the years in uric acid is its connection to insulin resistance. Now, you have heard me discuss before the, the, these categories of causes of insulin resistance, where at a high level, I have what I consider to be 
primary causes of insulin resistance and secondary causes of insulin resistance. The primary causes include chronically elevated insulin, stress, and inflammation. Now, that last one I put last for a reason because it's a good segue into the secondary causes of insulin resistance. What I consider to be some secondary causes among the definitions that I have that will qualify or the criteria I have that will qualify something for being considered a secondary, it's that it is dependent on one of the primary variables. And that's why I put uric acid as a secondary cause of insulin resistance. Now, there is an abundance of research showing that uric acid is capable of causing insulin resistance and does so in virtually every experimental model. Increased uric acid will make isolated cells in a cell culture become insulin resistant. Elevated uric acid will make the animal become insulin resistant and the human become insulin resistant. But it does so because of its actions on inflammation. And as I have alluded to before, including very recently in my discussion in classroom about saturated fat, 